Well, good morning, everyone. It's a rainy old day and a perfect day to to sit in front of your computer screen. I, mean, I think. <laughs> I want to welcome everybody. I'm Rick Bushnell, the chairman of the Environmental Stewardship Committee at the Foundation of the Arts and Sciences. A number of you have been on these sessions before, so welcome those of you who have been. This will be kind of a follow-up session to last week's where we had Ray Bukowski uh, talking about uh, all of the various options to alternate energy. So that's that's kind of where we're headed today. First of all, I want to, again, thank the Foundation of the Arts and Sciences for hosting these sessions. Uh, Daniela Kerner is the executive director, and without her enthusiastic support, we, of course, wouldn't be able to, uh, to put these things on. And Jenna uh, has been very helpful in working on all of the details. So we certainly want to thank them. And as I've said before, please consider supporting the foundation in some way. Um, membership's always a good thing. Lots going on or participating in any of the many activities, uh, the new summer of 2024 <laughs> uh, catalog will be out shortly talking about all the different things that are that are going on. So we certainly appreciate uh, that that support if you can if you can so do. I also kind of remind everybody that these sessions are are based on the fact that everything is connected and certainly looking out for our environment has a lot to do with what we put into our air or into our water, into our streams, into our bay and into our oceans. And a lot of that has to do with energy and the production of energy. And since that's going to be our topic, I'll kind of start off by saying, remember the 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 best way to reduce the impact of energy, regardless of how it's generated, is to conserve energy. And that kind of gets overlooked because we're always looking at new things and new ideas. But the oldest way, like in, in my family, when I was a kid, my dad always said, turn out the lights when you left the room. So not a bad thing for us to uh, th us to remember to do. So we'll be um, uh, this will be recorded. The information we put out at the website, those of you who find this interesting and want to refer somebody else, you have a way to do that. I will be using the chat feature. So if you have some questions any, any along, anywhere along the line, use the chat feature to pose those questions. I'll be reviewing them. And then occasionally I may interject a question if it's appropriate at that time. Otherwise, we will have time for questions uh, at the end. So um, I'm going to kind of shift gears and now just welcome Dave. Um, and uh, Dave uh, Hinchy um, spoke last year on this topic of energy, and we're going to be exploring where is hydrogen being used today? What is hydrogen? What's a hydrogen hub? Um, and some of the background knowledge about the hydrogen and the whole thing. So the focus is really going to be on the industrial uses of um, green, pink, hydrogen, and Dave will explain those different colors and, and all those things. Um, so just by way of introduction, um, Dave is the, um, uh, he's responsible for the PSE and G development efforts for both environmentally and socially responsible energy generation. Now, PS, uh, Public Service Enterprise Group, PSE and G, just as a reminder, they started uh, back in 1903. So they've been around for a long time and they're the largest provider of electric and natural gas. And Dave is uh, at PSE and G uh, responsible for uh, renewable environmental regulation. He's the lead for those things. He specializes in power development and he has over 24 years of experience. Now, prior to joining PSE and G in 2007, he was a consultant and he consulted for power, utility, gas industry, and federal government. So he has a broad background and has filled many different roles since 2007 at PSE and G, project management, environmental. So he's got a great background, dedicated professional, and, and a pretty good speaker. Too. So Dave, I'm going to turn things over to you. Thank you very much for joining us. Great. Thank you, Rick. And uh, thank you for that introduction and for having me today. 
Um, I think you did a, a better job introducing me than I would have of myself, so I appreciate that. Um, and you hit uh, the um, company uh, background as well, so just, just a little bit more information. Everybody's more familiar with the PSENG, so Public Service Electric and Gas component of the company. Um, but as Rick said, we're also Public Service Enterprise Group, which is like the parent company of that, which has... PSEG as a subsidiary, as well as PSEG Power and others. And in that group is uh, our nuclear generation fleet um, and also renewable energies uh, focused on uh, items like offshore transmission, um, offshore was offshore generation, um, and also hydrogen and other renewable energy sources that we are currently looking into. So with that, um, we'll start with the um, kind of diving into hydrogen. Um, and as Rick said, I mean, if there's any questions um, along the ways, please please send them over. Um, definitely prefer to be interactive or at the end, just uh, here for answer any questions or dive deeper into any topics that, that um, you'd wish to talk about. So I'm sure everybody has seen hydrogen headlines um, in the newspapers and on on TV, all over the place, where it's it's picking up more of a um, interest around around the country. Um, I remember talking about hydrogen oh, probably 10, 15 years ago, and it really didn't get much movement. Um, there were still a lot of hurdles, but I think the industry has definitely developed since then and is now becoming into more of a commercially available market. So what is hydrogen? Um, so it's really the most simplest abundant element in the world, in the universe, really. Um, it's the first element on the periodic table, uh, lightest one as well. It's color colorless, odorless, tasteless, but it's also flammable. So um, now hydrogen doesn't necessarily exist in the um, natural world on its own. You have to separate it. So you need energy, um, and we'll get into this, a lot of energy, to separate the hydrogen off of other sources. And primarily what we're looking at is water. Um, that hydrogen can be used as a fuel that produces uh, only water, heat, and electricity on the other side of it. So you put electricity in, and you can also get electricity out. So think about it as a type of battery um in in different ways um and it's also extremely safe with the proper precautions applied so current hydrogen production and and you know what when we started looking into this as a company um from my background i i started with uh, pseg in 2007 um working in the fossil fuel plants and we used hydrogen to um actually cool the generators because um, hydrogen in its purest form is inert. You need oxygen to, to create a combustion. So it was better, it, it, it's, the, it's the element that we use all across the industry in, in generation, but it's also used in other forms. So currently there's approximately 10 million metric tons of hydrogen produced in the US a year. Um, major producers, um, probably one that maybe people are more aware of is like air liquid. Um, they produce gases um, for, for hospitals, oxygen, nitrogen, um, but they also produce hy uh, hydrogen as well. And there's different methods being used right now. Um, steam methane reformation is probably the number one um, that is actually using natural gas to create hydrogen. Um, and we'll get into kind of how that works chemically in a, little, a couple minutes. Um, Coal gasification is another one. Um, uh, waste gasification, uh, where you're using kind of more of the biogases that are coming off of landfills. And then electrolysis, which is the area that we're looking into more uh, from a sustainable um, method. Um, like I said, 95% of the hydrogen produced right now is by steam methane reformation using natural gas. And production is typically done at large central plants, um, some smaller plants around the end user, but mostly large plants at this time. So current 
and future uses. So how do we use this hydrogen now? And, and one point I brought up was power generation and cooling the generators, but it's also used in oil refining, steel production, um, production of fertilizer, production of ammonia. Um, it's used in biodiesel. And um, from that perspective, you know, if you mix the hydrogen in with biodiesel, um, it actually helps create a cleaner, more complete combustion process. And that that actually reduces your carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide um, emissions from biodiesel. What we're finding out is if you're looking on the other side, it also that that same concept could also be used in other ways. So transportation is a big one for future uses. Um, buses, um, you're looking at uh, trucks, uh, potentially cars, you know, from a from a hydrogen use, and if you're looking at a complete package of, of um, greenhouse gas production and greenhouse gas reduction, um, there's a lot of talk on EVs, um, which EVs are great. They, they take the power, they store it, and they release it in your vehicle as you're driving. They work great for passenger cars. Um, but as you're getting up into the larger vehicles, so your, your trucks, your trains, your buses, um, EVs become problemsome. And that be, it, it's partly because of the weight. The weight of the batteries is quite significant, uh, especially because of the amount of the batteries that you will need to power those heavy sources. Um, whereas you look at the current way, um, the, um, and, uh, uh, sorry, the internal combustion engine works off of gas or diesel, as you're driving, you're using up the energy source, right? Your tank becomes emptier. Your weight reduces because it becomes emptier. And essentially your vehicle becomes more efficient. And that's how the, the, the benefit that the larger industrial trucks and buses use to move forward. With EVs, as you drive down the road, your, your vehicle starts becoming less and less efficient because of that weight drain. Doesn't matter as much in passenger cars. They are heavier, but not significantly. But if you're looking at something that's pulling a big, heavy trailer behind it, it's a lot of weight, which means a lot of batteries, which means a lot more weight that you're toting around. Switching that over to hydrogen, same concept as using gas. As you're using the energy source, your weight is diminishing. diminishing. So your efficiency is essentially going up as you're traveling. So that's one big market that, that we see um, moving forward and, and expanding into this alternate energy source where maybe EVs aren't the best solution. The other piece is sustainable aviation fuel, kind of going back to biodiesels. If you mix in hydrogen, it helps complete the combustion um, process um, a lot more efficiently. So you can reduce your greenhouse emissions um, as you're burning the energy source. Um, power generation, you know, power generation right now, we're focusing on just cooling. Um, but hydrogen is a energy source in itself. It could be used through electrolysis to create electric directly. It can also be used in power generation and burned as a fuel directly. Um, Hydrogen in itself does not have any um, emissions. Um, there are emissions from burning hydrogen, but that's from the ambient air. So you're mixing hydrogen and oxygen to create um, the combustion process. But with that, you're also uh, mixing in nitrogen. Uh, that's just the inert gas in the air. So while it's not as efficient as an electrolyzer, it's still a good uh, source of alternate energy. And then fuel cells as a backup method for batteries for storage. You know, you can you can store a lot of hydrogen and then release it as needed, um, either through electrolysis or through power generation and, and a, a burning cycle. So this is a high school chemistry pop quiz. Um, now, it might be more middle school because they're not fully balanced. And I'm not a chemistry professor either. So, but let's let's walk through it real quick. Um, so, how do you produce hydrogen from 
electrolysis? How is it how is it being used? And and I'll start with electrolysis because that's one that I think the industry really is looking at right now to be the the most um, efficient energy co conservative way. So you take water and you take energy and you take a lot of energy, masses of out of energy. And from that process, um, through electrolysis, you can create, you can split the um, water up and you're actually creating hydrogen and oxygen. That's about it. That's, that, that's what's coming out the end of the, uh, the electrolysis. Um, and then how do you create energy out of that? You pretty much reverse the process. So you're, you're combining the hydrogen with the oxygen and you're creating energy and water. So it's, it's a very efficient way of using and storing energy. Now, this third equation is the equation for steam methane reformation. And if you remember a few slides back, that is probably the number one uh, method of creating hydrogen currently. That takes your, your methane or, or your um, natural gas um, plus water and you add in heat, lots of heat, lots of steam. And the byproduct of that is your, your carbon monoxide, hydrogen, um, and then from there, you can actually take your carbon dioxide and water and create more carbon dioxide and hydrogen. So it's it's an efficient method of creating hydrogen, creates lots of it based off of what you're putting in, but it's also a producer of your greenhouse gases. So it's an, it's an area that we're looking into alternatives um, and looking into increasing and further developing electrolysis to be more efficient to take over the old um, method of steam methane uh, reformation. Um, and then the combustion of methane and natural gas, so you can see kind of where that goes, is you're looking at natural gas, you're combusting it with oxygen, and again, you're creating your, your greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, some water and lots of energy. So it's a, it's a good fuel. It gets us to where we need. Um, and there, there's methods to, other methods to create hydrogen. There's other methods to create your energy. Um, and there's also ways, um, and Ray might've hit on this last week, of, of making that natural gas more efficient as well, which is where you, you're mixing it with the, the hydrogen to um, offset natural gas, but also create uh, help with that combustion process. I'm so, going to interject for a second. Sure. Uh, but a couple things. One, yes, Ray did mention that last week as uh, that ability to put some of the hydrogen into the existing uh, natural gas distribution method uh, so he did mention that we don't really spend too much time on that. But a question that kind of came up the slide before this, where you were talking about that by introducing hydrogen uh, into, let's say, truck fuel, that the diesel fuel or the gasoline in the car would burn more efficiently. Is that is that did I get that right? Is that what you were saying could be done or is being done or did I misread that? So, you know, I think what, it, from a transportation point of view, um, we're not looking, and the industry is not necessarily looking at mixing the hydrogen into gases and into diesels at this time. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily in an efficient use of the, the fuel um, to get the energy source out. Um, when you're looking at biodiesels, on current uses, yes, that's that's what they do. They do mix hydrogen in. When you're looking at aviation, you're looking at a potential mixing. Um, okay, and so, that was yeah, I wanted to get because you mentioned the jet, the aviation. Yes, and then that was something I thought I had heard that they were in fact doing that or or studying that or something. I didn't know where that where where is that in the in the life cycle? Is that actually being tested somewhere or? Um, I believe it's being tested and it's very close to commercial use. 
Uh -huh. um, at this point, I mean, there's, there's, we're in some discussions, others are in discussions of, of creating the energy source to be able to do it. It is technically possible. I think the only thing holding back the use of hydrogen more is the creation of hydrogen. And how are we okay. getting the, the fuel source? All right. I didn't want to hijack your talk, but no, I... no, it's a good, good question. I want to make sure it's pretty clear, but yes, on the transportation side. So if you're looking at uh, buses and trucks and uh, trains, you're looking at using hydrogen as a direct energy source, not, not as a mixing source, but as a direct energy. Right. Okay. So, and that keys us up well, right, to how do you produce it? Where is it coming from? Um, and hydrogen is can be made in different ways. Um, and you'll probably, as if, if you're paying, like, if you're getting any new sources or anything about hydrogen, it probably talks about where it's coming from or the colors of hydrogen. Um, now, I can tell you when I first started looking into this a few years ago and, and we started going down the path of how do you create hydrogen? What does it mean? Um, really only thought that there was one color, green. Either it was brown coming from a, a, a biomass or a coal or something like that, or green. But there's many different colors of hydrogen. Um, and these are defined um, up and down. The, there's probably different charts of this, but this is the most accurate chart that we've seen when we talk to the federal government. So um, if that if that helps at all. So green is where you're producing hydrogen from a, a renewable energy source, such as wind, um, solar, wave energy, um, direct energy sources of that nature. Um, so you're pretty much plugging an extension cord into a wind turbine and, and creating hydrogen. Pink is seen as using um, a renewable source, uh, but using nuclear energy to create that. And again, it's direct. You're directly taking the nuclear energy and creating um, hydrogen from them. Yellow is a mix. So yellow is taking a renewable energy source, which could be solar, wind, wave, nuclear, putting it into the power grid and then creating hydrogen. So say you had an agreement at your own home um, to power your home with, with solar or power from hydro power um, with, with some of those agreements and you plugged an electrolysis producer at your home, it would essentially be yellow because you're using the grid to get that power. And then you get into more of the um, more, as you can see, carbon, uh, sorry, switch sides, carbon intensive ways of creating the hydrogen, um, which is the steam reframe, um, methane reformation, um, using directly natural gas to create it as a power source. And then also your biomass is your coals and everything. And you you start getting into creating carbon dioxide, more and more heavy carbon introduction. So what we like to stay at and what the, the industry is pushing and the, the federal government is pushing, and we'll get into that more, is your green and your pink. How can you produce it from a renewable energy source that's sustainable? So you probably heard me talk about a lot about electrolysis. Like how are we actually producing the um, hydrogen? And electrolysis works in two ways. It, it can work forward and it can work backwards. So um, electrolysis is using electricity and electricity, I mean a lot. A lot of electricity is needed to create hydrogen and some water. So your, your, your main power stock is electricity. So that's why that, that power source is important. So going back to um, where you're getting that from, if you're looking at renewable hydrogen, you're looking at using your um, wind power, your solar power, your nuclear energy to create that green and pink and, uh, hydrogen. Um, now, electrolysis uh, consists of using an anode and a cathode and putting that uh, that that source into water. And essentially, you're splitting the atoms inside of that containment. Um, and there's there's different ways of doing that. Um, 
And the outcome of that is the split up of the water into hydrogen and oxygen. So there's different methods. Um, there's alkaline systems that uses a liquid alkaline solution as the electrolyte. So that kind of helps the electrodes move around in a solution of water. Um, that is probably by far the largest way of, uh, of producing hydrogen to date. Um, it's, it's an old method. It's been around for probably close to 80 years at this point. Um, the, the nice thing about that um, is that alkaline solution does not really get replaced. It, it, it probably is in operations anywhere from 15 to 20 years before you have to do anything with the product. Um, so there is that alkaline piece that goes into it. So that's one, one method that we look into. The other piece that, that's really picking up right now that we're looking into more and more is PEM. So that uses a polymer electrolyte membrane. So it uses different plates. It takes that anode and that cathode with the electric going in and there's plates inside um, a vessel and water passes through it and that accelerates the separation of the atoms into hydrogen and oxygen. Um, those plates are coated with um, some precious materials, kind of like what's in your catalytic converter in your car now. Um, so it's producing that reaction. And those plates, again, they take a long time to get used up, um, to get depleted or have to be replated. And you're looking at a seven year life cycle running 24 seven producing hydrogen before you have to ever go in and, and adjust or, or touch these membranes. Um, and then the last piece is solid oxide, and that uses a ceramic material um, and a high temperature and steam to use. It, it The benefits of it is it does create a lot of hydrogen. The, the negative from that is you have to put a steam source into it. So where are you getting that extra energy source? So you're putting energy, you're putting water, and you have to put some type of steam into it. So... It's not necessarily one that we're looking into more and more because it's it's more energy um, dependent um, as you're looking forward, um, but it is out there and it is used in the industry. I've got a comment here in the chat field. It sure. says, I've read recently about gold hydrogen. Now we're talking about colors. Hydrogen that exists in the natural state in the ground and does not need to be pro uh, produced. It has been found in huge amounts in the United States and in France. Can you provide some further insight on this form of hydrogen uh, and its future? I am actually going to look into that. I have not heard uh, about gold hydrogen. And um, it's, you know, if, if that's available, um, I, I have heard that there are small amounts that are um, located in caverns that could be tapped into. But if that's abundantly available, um, I think, again, getting that into um, commercial circulation to, to, to benefit um, climate change and to benefit carbon uh, reduction, 100% for it. So um, I'll, I'll touch on real quick the, the differences between natural gas and hydrogen just from a transportation point of view. So you know, we have a network of natural gas pipelines pretty much across the country. Um, now, hydrogen can be used in those gas lines either by blending or you can create a natural gas pipeline and reuse that pipeline just to move natural gas around. Problem with that is nat hydrogen is a much smaller molecule than natural gas. So any pipeline that you're using or looking to use for hydrogen has to be newer or has to be what they call lined. So they change that in making sure that all the seals, all of the um, pipelines themselves are in, in um, better shape, um, no cracking, no nothing that would be acceptable for natural gas. You pretty much have to be have a 0.1% leak rate on this. But it is possible, and and the industry and the the world uh, the country is actually moving in that direction. So, as we find more energy sources, I think the the goal is to make sure we're ready for them and ready for uses. 
And by the way, I'll interject that uh, Ray last week did mention that all of the new infrastructure that uh, that they are putting in the ground is capable of handling the smaller molecular structure. Um, so it was kind of an interesting, you know, point that that they're aware of that and and moving forward. And matter of fact, I think he said it was a very very large amount of pipeline that's already capable. Yes, yes. Um, and PSEG is do is is going down that same path on anything that we are um, replacing or putting in new uh, will be ready, um, much like Ray's organization. Um, I think that the area where the country struggles is in the older systems. And PSCG has quite a few of those. Um, being over 100 years old as we are, some of those gas lines are old. So as they're getting replaced, they're getting replaced to the newer standards to be able to take on the newer energy source. But there's still quite a few out there and quite a few around the country. I would say that the large majority is not ready yet. So it's definitely, I think, sizing up, but a long way to go to get there still. So let me see, I lost my side. I think hydrogen benefits. And, I, you know, we've touched on this. We've went through it um, on kind of using the sources and the benefits of uh, of getting to a point where you're reducing your greenhouse gases. Um, but you're also looking at using hydrogen power to improve overall air quality um, and promote energy security. So, you know, when you're combusting natural gas, when you're combusting diesel, when you're combusting um, gasoline, um, you have that export. So you don't just have carbon monoxide, you also have um, your, your nitrous oxide, you have your, your SO2, you have a lot of other contaminants that are coming out, your heavy metals um, that are coming out the end of the tailpipe or the, um, the smokestack or whatever you're producing or burning that energy on. Hydrogen does not have that. So especially through electrolysis, you, you don't, your, your output is oxygen um, and hydrogen, large amounts of hydrogen, some oxygen, that oxygen actually can be captured and used in medical sources and or other ways as well. It can, it, in some cases it's just released, in other ways it's captured and reused. Um, hydrogen can also support the integration of variable renewables from electric being used in different storing options. So what does that mean? You know, we can create a vast amount of energy using wind power, but wind doesn't always blow, doesn't always blow at the intensity you want it to. So most of the time it blows during your party that's blowing everything around the yard that you don't want it to blow, you know? Same thing with solar, you know, it's only there half of the day. On weekends, it's not there at all. So like your energy source when you are switching over to, to renewables is becomes intermittent. There's different ways to store that energy though. You know, one way is batteries. Batteries are a great way, very efficient way to store energy. However, production of those batteries are very intensive. Getting the sources to create the batteries are uh, might become somewhat problemsome as we kind of step up the uses more and more. Um, lithium is very, very in uh, intensive to mine, you know? Um, so there are some drawbacks to it. It's still a great way of storing energy. Um, another way is, um, and we, we've used this a lot in the past, is your pump storage. You actually create a reservoir and you're pumping water into this reservoir while you have the power. And when you need the power back, you're pretty much releasing the reservoir into a hydroelectric uh, power plant. And you're converting that stored energy in the form of water into power. That's another method. It is very, um, takes a lot of land to do that. Um, it has some environmental drawbacks, some environmental benefits. So it's not widely used as, as it, it probably could be because of all the drawbacks, but it's another way of storing power. 
hydrogen can add in that solution. So when you're looking at creating hydrogen, you don't have to use it right away. You can store hydrogen. It's a gas. You can store it in many ways. You can look at it and inject it into old um, caverns that have been mined to store it underground. You can store it in different vessels. Um, you can also liquefy hydrogen, just as you liquefy natural gas and liquefy ammonia um, to increase storage capacities. So you could store lo very large quantities of hydrogen when you have the abundant of electricity, of, of electricity generation and then use it when you need it. You can use it through the electrolysis process to back it out and to electric, electric, or you can combust it, like I said, in, in a, a, say a natural gas turbine um, and create electricity as needed as well. So we see it kind of like a, a complementary solution. Um, you know, with, when you're looking at um, energy conservation, when you're looking at um, carbon reductions and you're looking at emissions reduction, there's, there's not going to be one solution that does everything. There's There, there needs to be a combination of, of complementing alternatives that could be used together to get to a clean energy kind of revolution, clean energy source and path moving forward. So hydrogen safety, and you know, um, I had a picture of the Hindenburg on this slide. Um, and uh, my uh, corporate communications department told me I cannot put that on the slide. <laughs> so, and the reason I did that, and the reason that we, we keep on pushing to say that is, you know, everybody, you know, you talk hydrogen, and I think the first thing that comes to mind is the Hindenburg blimp blowing up, creating devastation, and, uh, and that's the first thing everybody thinks of. It's not safe, that's why. So a couple of facts on that. The Hindenburg, believe it or not, was the, 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 the blimp itself was covered in a material to make it um, kind of gas sealable. So think about it, like the hydrogen molecule is the smallest molecule on earth. It is, it goes through anything. So you have to create something that can actually hold it. So what was the best thing that they found to hold it? Well, it was a mixture of jet fuel. So they covered the entire Hindenburg blimp in this jet fuel material to make it air impermeable, um, which was great. It worked. The problem was it's also an extreme, I mean, it's jet fuel. It's, it's a huge accelerant. So. When you saw, when you see it, um, videos of it, um, it, it's it's kind of slowly burning as it goes down. That's your the jet coating on the jet fuel as it's being used up in the 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 blimp itself as it's going down. So it's there was a lot of I think more to that story than was let out. And the more and more we looked into it and coming up with a a do does PSEG really want to get involved in hydrogen? We had to kind of debunk that. You know, PSEG we we pride ourselves on safety. You know, keeping our workers safe, keeping people safe, keeping our customers safe. So hydrogen is no more dangerous or flammable um, than natural gas or gasoline. Um, it rapidly diffuses. So if you put a container of hydrogen like this cup here, it kind of just diffuses into the atmosphere, it's gone. Um, a lot faster than any other source because it it's, you're, you're from a, an atomic point of view, it's the lightest element. It wants to bond, it wants to be happy. It's not happy alone. So it goes out and finds neighbors. Um, so it dilutes very quickly. And when it dilutes, it's non-flammable. By volume, hydrogen is one third the combustion energy of natural gas. So that means if you have a natural gas in one cup for that same energy um, combustion process, for that same explosive view that you wanna see, you will need three cups of hydrogen. Um, it When it combusts, it combusts relatively low radiant heat um, because of the combustion process creates cooling water vapor as it, as it combines back into um, something else, which is in its state water and has 
a higher oxygen requirement for ignition. So you need more oxygen in the room than you would need natural gas. And this is why the, the power industry actually uses it in, um, in cooling generators because it, it's, it's inert on its own. You know, it, you, if you get a spark in a generator, it's not gonna, it's not gonna ignite. You need a pretty good amount of oxygen there to get it to ignite. Okay, so federal laws. So this is where I think the federal government is going um, with hydrogen, the use of hydrogen. This is probably why you hear it more and more in the news. So Congress passed an appropriation bill um, for $8 billion for the infra uh, sorry, bipartisan infrastructure law. That part of that was to create four, at least four, and we'll get into the hubs in a minute, um, of hydrogen hubs between 2022 and 2026. On top of that, the Inflation Reduction Act um, that was passed, what was that, last year? Um, established further incentives for clean hydrogen production um, with higher incentives for emission technologies with lower, um, sorry, higher incentives for hydrogen technologies with lower emission sources. Um, and that is looking at producing the hydrogen at $3 a kilogram. And DOE, um, there, there was a lot of talk about this, not as much lately, but this, it's still a federal focus, is DOE's hydrogen shop. You know, as the, it, what is the saying? Um, the, it's something along the lines of like the, the nature of necessity is, or the nature of uh, progress is brought on by necessity. You know, the more that, the industry or more that people are interested in a source. So say here, hydrogen, the more development, the more progress that is made to make that process of creating the hydrogen or creating the product more efficient. So, I mean, look at your computers. Creating a computer chip used to be like the size of this room, very expensive. The more and more we use it to today's technology, you can go out and buy a laptop or two, 300 bucks, and it is the same computing power as that multi-million machine was 40 years ago. And what, probably a hundredth of the size. So that's what the DOE hydrogen shock goal is, is figuring out a way to reduce the cost of creating the clean hydrogen down to $1 per kilogram within the next decade. So, and I'll show you why this is important. So this is from the DOE, and this is called the DOE willingness to pay. And this is where hydrogen or the fuel source is utilized and how much the how much they're willing to pay for renewable hydrogen. So like I said, hydrogen can be created by steam methane reformation or coal or other ways, and it's relatively cheap to create. In some cases, in... Um, in, in refineries, it's actually a byproduct. So they sell it, they make money, but it's really just a byproduct of what they're, what they're doing. So if you're looking here on this chart, it actually shows you different, um, uh, different pieces within the industry um, that are the target for what they're looking to pay for hydrogen. So right now, like I said, we're really focused on um, Medium heavy duty vehicles, so your trucks, your 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 buses, your your trains, possibly your your aviation, and jet fuel is expensive, very expensive. So you have uh, a four dollar per kilogram willingness to pay. So that's how much the industry is would absorb that for. If you put it in, you can get it. It makes sense. The sorry, second the. As you go down and down in your willingness to pay and the cost that actually the industry needs to make it useful for them, you get cheaper and cheaper. And this is where that $1 mark comes in. So if we can make hydrogen in a way that it only costs a dollar to make it per kilogram, across, pretty much across the country, it can be used in any different way. You can use it for heat. You can use it for energy storage. You can use it for ammonia. You know, I think this this is the big piece, energy storage. And it goes back to kind of that wind isn't always blowing, solar's not always working. 
how do you use that energy efficiency? And if you can get it down to creating it in a way that it costs a dollar to create, it becomes very competitive, very attractive to actually use as energy storage. Right now, maybe not. A couple of years, the industry could get there. So what is a hydrogen hub? So as I was saying, you know, um, Congress enacted this way to move forward with the hydrogen industry and these hydrogen hubs. And it's a Kickstarter of the in industry across the country. So it's networks of clean hydrogen producers, consumers, um, connected together in an infrastructure. So you're looking at someone that creates it and you're matching that up with someone that uses it and figuring out how to get it there and stand up an economy where it's all used. Um, the hub must also produce benefits to the host community, as in where it's being created and where it's being utilized, as in, can it reduce your air pollution in that area? Can it um, increase permanent jobs? It, there has to be some type of benefit to doing this for, for not just on the, yes, it'll help with carbon reduction, it'll help with greenhouse gases, but it can also help in these other ways. And it must produce hydrogen that meets the clean hydrogen production standards. So you're looking at more of relying on hydrogen from that green and those pink sources. DOE hydrogen hub process. So, and, and we'll get into kind of where they are in a second. Um, and maybe, maybe it makes more sense to just go to the next slide. This is a lot of information, kind of the details on the different hubs and how much they were individually awarded. Um, and what I'm gonna do just to allow for time is go on to where they are. So you're looking at, um, what is it? Eight different hubs across the country. Um, the one that's more important to us is this one here. If you can see my cursor, the Mid-Atlantic. Didn't work. The Mid Atlantic Hydrogen Hub, and that is New Jersey, Delaware, and uh, part of Pennsylvania. Um, and that is actually the hydrogen hub that PSCG is active in. So, the Mid Atlantic Hydrogen Hub, or as we like to call it, Mach 2, um, and I always thought Mach 2 was a cool name, and it took me like three months to figure out what it actually meant. So, makes sense, Mid Atlantic Hydrogen Hub. Um, it is uh, Southern New Jersey, Delaware, and Southeast Pennsylvania. Um, what we're looking forward to, to moving on with a project on is a power purchase agreement using PSEG nuclear. So using that, P, using that pink energy to produce hydrogen. Um, the hydrogen would be used for current uses would be refineries that are in the area that are have a current use for hydrogen. But really focusing on that the trucks, the ports, the large city vehicles, the airport ground equipment, the stuff that you, makes more sense to move over to a hydrogen economy, standing up that hydrogen economy. Now, down here is an interesting chart, and this, this came out of uh, actually New Jersey carbon uh, decarbonization goals. And as you can see here, the current inventory of CO2 emitters, of the largest of that right now in New Jersey is transportation. So that's where we're focusing on is those heavy industrial sources. So your buses, your trucks, your trains, um, aviation, and getting that reduction. And like I said earlier, EVs might not be a good way to do it. It might be part of the solution, but there needs to be another way. And that, that hydrogen, as we see it, and the industry is starting to see it, um, gets kind of gets into solving that problem. And as you can see here too, uh, another big piece of it is your buildings, your electricity, your other industrial uses in your landfills. But if you're looking at industrial and you're looking at landfills, comparatively to transportation and buildings, those are big areas in, in, the, in, in New Jersey that we need to focus on. So I think um, just to wrap up here and kind of what we're looking at currently is, is like I said, we're looking at a project that is using um, energy, lots a lot of, of energy from our nuclear plants in South Jersey um, to produce pink hydrogen and using the electrolysis format to create that hydrogen um, 
and we're looking at producing a, roughly 25 metric tons um, a day. Um, we're evaluating the PEM, which is kind of that first uh, view I showed you with, with the electrolysis. Um, and we're looking at, again, using the nuclear sites to create that pink energy. So I think that that covers pretty much everything. Um, Rick, I, I think open it up to questions or comments or any type of feedback at, at this point. Perfect. Perfect timing. So uh, uh, someone uh, put in the chat, maybe the words you were looking for, a necessity is the mother of invention or? Yes, yes, like thank that. you. That's it, yes. When you're speaking <laughs> at these you. events, a lot of times you're like, you're thinking about what you're doing and you're just like, Thank you, Susan. Good views come out. So, thank you. Okay, a couple a couple things came to my mind. One is that when you were talking about the solar produ solar producing the energy to be able to create to use electrolysis to create the um, hydrogen, a uh, question: How scalable is that? One of the things I know is that you are only a let's say you've got solar on your roof, you're only allowed to have solar capacity that approximates your solar consumption. And theoretically, the, the uh, not theoretically, in fact, your electric meter is running backwards when it's sunny and you're not in your house running your air conditioner. <laughs> and then, you know, so what would happen if you, if you had a roof that could be twice that size, accommodate twice the amount of uh, panels so that you could be, producing hydrogen in a scaled down hydrogen producing uh, electrolysis machine. Is it scalable like that? So that you then have this other energy short source at your disposal. Maybe you're using hydrogen for your car or, or whatever. You know, maybe in the future. Um, and I, and I think it goes back to um the the whole view of the scalability at this point. So as you get smaller and smaller, it becomes very expensive um, to 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 produce. So your electrolysis is expensive, your energy consumption is expensive, and your product coming out is small. Um, when we're looking at producing twenty five um, metric tons a day, you're looking at a need of uh, I'm probably going to get this wrong, but upwards of 50 megawatts of power. So that's a, a massive amount of power to do that. And as you go up in energy uh, hydrogen production, you're actually your curve of the need for energy power goes down. And that's what we're looking at. The larger that we can go to create hydrogen on these large scale industrial sources, it actually becomes a lot more efficient to create. Um, so you know, maybe in 10, 20 years, there might be a home system to, to create hydrogen and storing it. Um, but I think the better uses would be your batteries to, to actually store the energy at, at this time, because um, they're a lot more efficient and they're kind of more, they're not one-to-one, -one, but your energy loss is a lot less than would be hydrogen. When hydrogen, you, you can mitigate that energy loss by going larger and larger. Well, then maybe, um, maybe what it would be is, that people would be allowed to produce more energy than they consume because the energy company could be using that excess capacity on the network to, because it's not scalable, but to use a giant place where they create hydrogen out of the excess electricity going onto the grid. I, I understand from the that the P uh, the PUC didn't want to have homeowners generating excess electricity to put them in competition with the other energy producing sources, or that's what the, the talk was. Anyhow, that right. no, and that's a good point. You know, co consolidatively, if you if you can consolidate all that extra electricity in, in that solar prospect in the grid, it there's a name for it. It's called yellow. Um, or color, okay. I should say. So that is contemplated uh, pulling in other sources and consolidating it and using that to produce hydrogen. Now, the other side of using solar to create the hydrogen is, you know, like anything, um, or I shouldn't say like anything, um, but hydrogen likes to be on all the time. It likes to be producing hydrogen. So the electrolysis process 
works better if you just turn on and leave it on. Um, you know what also works really good if you just turn on and leave it on? Nuclear power. It's constantly producing power. So those two energy sources match up very well. And I think that's why we get into yellow is that electrolysis likes to be on all the time. So when you have the excess energy from solar, it's great. It can use that. But other, other times when you don't have solar, it has to use grid power. So that's why you have still some um, um, emissions there because you're using some other type of energy source because it's not consistent, but it's still a good solution. It still goes in the direction we need to go. Okay. And uh, going to kind of the end of your presentation, uh, well, actually, I'm going to, there was a, a question in the uh, in the comments, will, will the slides be available for future review? Yes, they will be. They'll be posted at the foundation's website, like the other slides and presentations. And uh, Carolyn uh, Nickerson, uh, our friend at, at SciStarter, said, don't forget that there are citizen science projects at SciStarter, and that's available through the foundation's website also. So energy conservation, you know, and those things. One thing uh, kind of at the end that you were talking about the hub, um, uh, because it was at the end, I'm not sure everybody got the gravity of how important this is and what a cool thing this is to have going on in our own backyard, that one of these uh, hubs is a value of seeing the, the, I guess, the scalability of being able to produce the hydrogen and then use the hydrogen. And this is all happening in our, what, three or four contiguous state area. And if I heard you right, the, the energy to create the hydrogen is coming from the nuclear plant, which is saying that there must be excess capacity at that plant to be able to do this. Is that, is, do I have that right? I mean, so, so we're using some excess capacity to produce an energy source that can be used and distributed in different ways. Is, is that right? It, so there are rules around how much of an existing energy source that you can use to produce hydrogen. You don't want to take your, your clean energy, um, major production of clean energy source off the grid to create hydrogen. That, that's right. what we're looking to do. And if you're looking at the, the nuclear um, um, energy that is that, that we produce uh, for New Jersey, you're looking at like over 3,000 megawatts. Like it's, it's, that's a lot. It's a lot of power that is produced. I think it's 80% of the clean energy that is produced in New Jersey or 90% um, currently. So the, the amount of energy that we're looking to reroute to create this hydrogen is not as very small comparatively to what we're looking at, at pr what we produce. And it's really more of a, can this be done? How do we ha help the hubs and how do we start jumpstarting the economy? So it's just, a, it's an alternate use in producing um, a green energy source, with, which is in nature of, of what I think PSEG stands for is how do we decarbonize? How do we look to create um, a green energy economy? And the second part of that question then is, what are the uses for that hydrogen? You, you alluded to some, um, and what are there... Is it going into these things and what are these things now? So for the hydrogen hub itself, um, and this, I'm trying to think of, actually, let me go back to another slide if you have a minute, here we go. So the hydrogen hub itself um, and and Mach 2 is, is really looking at, like we said, producing the hydrogen. Um, we're looking at producing it in New Jersey, um, using New Jersey sources. Um, and that would be used and the part of the hub is to match up the end uses with the production. So we're working with the hub right now to, to define what those end uses would be. Um, a lot of them is, is looking at transportation, looking at different buses or trucks, uh, sustainable aviation fuel, current industry sources. And that's a big one. And you see that's like right in the middle here. So you're creating the energy, you're creating the hydrogen, you're storing it in some method or transporting it in some method. First is industry, and that's to get the current uses of using the non-renewable source of hydrogen switched over to a renewable source. And that's that's like that's a big hitter right there. Can we can we do that? And the second piece of that is 
what else can we do with it? Can we use it for aviation? Can we use it for buses and trucks? Can we use it for ports? Ports have a decarbonization goal in New Jersey um, to try to get all their equipment and reduce their emissions. EVs are one solution. Hydrogen might be another. Um, and then going further down that, can it be used in a distribution hub for power generation, for mixing into natural gas lines? So I think the, the hub is contemplating all these concepts and matching up what best fits at the given time to create and stand up that new industry. And what kind of time frame do you think that there is before the, so, so there are two parts of the equation. There's one that is the generation, storage, and distribution. Then there's the other side of the equation that is the consumption and the different, the different ways that the consumption would fill the need, like the ports, like the transportation. So when kind of I'm, I'm going to get this wrong but uh, uh to shed some light in it you know it's it, the hubs need to create both the production and the end use at the same time so in other words when the hydrogen is ready it can be utilized you don't want to just have the hydrogen there and then what you can do with it Right. And on the backside of that, you don't want to have uh, an industry ready for it, but no fuel to burn, to use it or, or electrolyze it, you know? So I, I think if you're looking at the the early starters, um, you're probably looking three to five years to get off the ground. Um, and then as that goes, probably within that 10-year mark, and I think that goes back to that hydrogen shot is is can we get more efficient? Can that build out? You know, you, you'll probably see a lot more within the next 10 years. And where will that be? Will that information be available through where where is information about the activity of what's going on with the with our hub with the Mach 2? Where is that available? We certainly there. want to have a link at our website to that. Sure, I'll provide you a link. Um they do have a website um of of the Mach 2 and what they're working on. Um the hub also has they, they held a public information session recently um, and they're looking to hold more. So there are opportunities to, to listen in or to attend um, different um, information sessions in person as well. But we'll definitely provide you that link that, that everybody can get to. That's excellent. Okay, well, we're just a little past noon. I don't see any new questions in the chat. Uh, as I've said in the past, my, my gauge of of, of how good a presentation is if we have as many people at the end as we have at the beginning, that's an A. So David, you, you earned an A today. We have exactly the same. Matter of fact, we picked up one uh, along the way. And I, I just think uh, this is really useful, useful knowledge, things that aren't, that are maybe heard of, but not talked about so much. And I really do think that people that are concerned about energy and concerned about windmills and one thing or another need some background uh, that that this really provides. So I want to thank you. Oh, we've got a question here. Can hydrogen and gasoline be combined for cars? That's Is a good question. I, I, I'm not sure about that. I know hydrogen and diesel or biofuel, it, it can be mixed together to help complete the combustion and reduce greenhouse gases. I'm not sure on gasoline. Um, I, I think we can we can look into that. I don't think it's a big piece that is currently being explored by the industry. Um, it might be just because of the chemical, I guess, connections between them. Um, right. But but really, from a bio and from a diesel perspective, it can. Okay. All right. Well, then, as I've said, thank you so much. I think everyone enjoyed it. I certainly did. We will post your slides. We will post the links to further information. And uh, hopefully, David, next year we can have you back <laughs> and get yet another update on what's happening with hydrogen. So Great. Thank, thank you. you. I, I would love to. And uh, thank you, everybody, for attending. And Rick, thank you for inviting me. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dave. It was very enlightening. Very oh, good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All right. Well, we'll see you all next Saturday and um, and have a good week in between. Hope it dries out a little bit. Bye bye. Thank you all. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Dave. Dave, just send me those uh, email me those links. I'll be able to provide them on our website. 
Okay, wonderful. Will do. Great. Thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Great. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. Bye.